Hello, welcome to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. I'm your host, Cameron Guerra, an engineer at IT Pro TV, and with me today is Taylor Fossack. One of my boss, actually. He's not he's on my team, but he's my boss as well. But uh, we are just super excited to be here today. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Cam. Thanks for hosting me on the show this week. Of course, man. We're on episode 35. That's a big deal. So thank you all for listening, and we're just hoping you like to stick around. Taylor, what are we talking about today? Uh, So today we're going to be digging into a post about kind of maybe versus either and error reporting. Uh, Mm -hmm. But before we get to that, I think we have uh, an announcement from the community at large, not an announcement from us that we should talk about a little bit, which is the GHC 2021 proposal has been accepted. So. Yeah, very exciting. Uh, Cam, I know we talked about this on a previous episode of the podcast, but you got anything to say about it now that it's accepted? I mean, I think I think it's cool. I think it's interesting to see the data and how the votes went um, as far as the committee selecting what to, what to bring in and what not to bring in. Um, still, for me, personally shocked Overloader Strings isn't there, but that's okay. You know, we can continue to you know enable that extension for us. It, it helps with our uh, API development. Yeah, I think it's one of the most popular extensions, but this is, since it's the first cut of this new process, I think they tried to play it a little safe. And overloaded mm-hmm. strings can introduce a lot of ambiguity, so I see why maybe they left it off. That's fair, that's fair. Yeah, I mean, and it, you know, they did great work with keeping it backwards compatible with Haskell 2010 and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, do you, do you have any, like, uh, just give a, a listener a quick point of like what's the difference between this and you know a language standard sure uh once again i'll I'll point back to our previous episode in october where we talked about this in a little more detail but um this isn't a full-blown new version of the haskell language report so it's not like a new standard and the difference is that or like the pragmatic difference is that ghc 2021 is a language extension that just enables a bunch of other language extensions. So it's like an alias for these other things. Mm -hmm. Um, And a new version of the standard would be hopefully well specified enough that someone would be able to implement a different compiler that implements that standard. So most of the time GHC is the only compiler that we talk about, but there are others and there have been others in the past. And uh, the language specification could allow more of those in the future. No, yeah, awesome. Well, th- thanks for that tidbit. We, uh, you know, obviously, like Taylor said, go check back at our other podcast where we talked more in depth about that. Or feel free to check it out in this week, this week's edition of Haskell Weekly. Mm-hmm. So, um, but yeah, like yeah, I mentioned, that's not uh, what we're here to talk about today. Uh, instead, we're going to be talking about maybe and either, right, Cam? Ooh, yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, you know, for those who have been in programming in Haskell for a period of time, you know, you've come across this decision of, do I use an either here or do I use maybe here? And, you know, today the post we're going to be kind of diving more into is, you know, leaning more towards, hey, use either here because, you know, you don't want to lose necessarily information. Um, And I think we can easily kind of navigate that by, you know, I mean, it's really up to, you know, what the case is, right? Like everything's different. Nobody, you know, when you're, you know, saying for input, like maybe it's generally okay for an input. Like it's either there or it's not. Um, and you can kind of, you know, but that could also work for either. Like it's, <laughs> it's not there and you, it gives you some useful information. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, he kind of dives in here. Um, do you want to kind of give what his nutshell per se is? Sure. And, and even before we get to the like 30,000 foot overview of this, some of the, the motivation. So maybe is sort of in a way Haskell's answer to null. Most other mainstream programming languages have a concept of null that is a valid value for any type. And this is frequently referred to as the billion dollar mistake because it causes so many bugs and, mm-hmm. and weird program behaviors. Um, And in Haskell, we don't have that. And instead, if you had something that would be nullable in another language, in Haskell, you model that with maybe. And I think the high level overview of uh, Roberts, the the post author here of his, like what he's putting forth here is if you are wanting to return maybe, 
perhaps you should return either instead, so that if something does go wrong, you'll know which thing went wrong, rather than just like, well, something somewhere went wrong, good luck. Mm -hmm. Which is better than a null pointer error, but maybe only a little bit. Right. I mean, if you're parsing through some code and you're like, ah, it could be these five possible, you know, null values or nothing values, like, which one is it? Um, yeah. Where, you know, the fact that Haskell has the either concept really should allow us to at least consider it when we are choosing and reaching for maybe. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I will say that in our day-to-day -day life developing a web application at IT Pro TV, we frequently do both types of conversions where we have a maybe value and we want to attach additional information to it in the case where it's nothing, mm -hmm. or we have some value that already has extra information on it and we want to strip that off to get a maybe value. And usually this is to meet, you know, the various contracts of, oh, we need to turn a, we need to give a maybe to this function and we have an either or vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, but very often we have functions that give us back a maybe and we have to add extra information there that says like, oh, we were looking at this field and we expected this type and it was that type, but we got this value, which didn't parse for this reason. And that's way more useful for us when we're debugging that problem than just getting nothing. Like oh, right. something went wrong. Who knows? Right. And I feel like, you know, <clears throat> there's a large Haskell ecosystem out there of, you know, libraries and packages that help people solve problems. And, uh, you know, I think we've had people file issues and bugs on certain packages because this returning a maybe and there's some sort of failure that they don't have any idea to why that happened. Um, and so, you know, the author here kind of uses uh, servant multipart as a uh, kind of example to say, hey, here's something that used to use maybe, now it's using an either, and it's honestly a better package for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for those that may not be familiar, a multipart is a part of like a, an HTTP form payload. So whenever you have a form on an HTML page and you hit submit, that gets submitted as a multipart, and then that has to be parsed on the server. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's JSON, sometimes it's uh, it looks like a query string, but regardless of how it looks, you're parsing that. And if it if you can't parse it, you want to know why rather than just returning a 400 to the user and saying, sorry, try again. Yeah, I mean, that's not really giving anybody any information to go anywhere. I mean, you know, it's kind of that whole just putting somebody, you know, always telling that person to turn right and they're just going to mm -hmm. go in a circle, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and then to kind of support um, this suggested shift into either versus maybe, um, he proposes, or, or maybe I'm not sure if he's proposing this function or if he's talking about one that already exists called unexplained for doing that conversion I talked about just a minute ago where you have an either and you need a maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and we recently introduced two functions like this to our prelude where we called them note and hush, and uh, they may have come from somewhere else again, I don't know, but they're, they're such simple functions, they're easy to write. So note takes a maybe value and the like um, string normally that you wanna mm -hmm. give on the error and gives you back an either, and then hush goes the other way. So it's a little evocative of how they work. It's very similar to unexplained hushes. Right, um, and those are, are very nice because that you can use them inline really you know, succinctly and works out nicely. Yeah. Um, and I think he has an interesting example here of talking about ASON, the JSON library, where it has a bunch of different functions for doing decoding that return various different, you know, is, is it an either, is it a parser, is it a maybe, is it whatever? Um, and it feels like you could just have one of those and then these note or hush type functions to, you know, Usher massage it in the shape you want. Right. <clears throat> yeah, and I mean, you know, ASON's a good example of a, a library that does have a lot of support for either. Um, <clears throat> whereas, you know, obviously they have maybe, and I think that's kind of their default, but they've, you know, with the new age and, you know, everybody realizing, oh yeah, we may want this error information passed along, you know, they, they've kind of added this either, um, either functions into their uh, library. So yeah, much appreciated. I, I know we use, you know, either decode a lot. Um, so. Yeah, we use that all the time. And I think their error messages have gotten a lot better. And 
I know there used to be a separate package for getting better error messages out of ASON, and so maybe they took a page out of that book and rolled it into the library itself. Mm hmm Yeah, and you know, I, th I think, uh, you know, ASON has some basic ways to signal a failed conversion, right? Um, whether mm -hmm. it you know, has that custom error message with the either or just it's nothing, right? which you yeah. know isn't always informative and it kind of makes it a little difficult but you know there's a certain um type classes that you know maybe has that either doesn't which i think we'll touch on here in a little bit yeah and like you mentioned with ASON, there are lots of different ways it reports errors and i think that comes from under the covers it's like a parsing library i don't know if they implement their own or if they rely on one it's probably Addo parsec or something like that but mm -hmm. those parsing libraries often uh implement either well one of the type classes of alternative or monad plus and both of those have this concept of like choice give me either this one or if that one fails give me this other one um and as a consequence they also have the identity for choice i think it's identity where you say this will always fail because normally if you have a list of choices what do you do if none of them match then you get back nothing um and that's very well modeled by maybe, and like you mentioned, it has instances for these things, but the error messages are pretty bad. Cause like with JSON, if you're saying, I wanna parse a number or a string, or I didn't get either of them, so the error message you get is worthless, so I don't know. Yeah, like what do you really want from me? Right. You'll never know, ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there are things you can do to improve this too. Like you could make your last case an explicit error message that says, you know, I was looking for one of these values and I didn't get any of them. And I know that some parsing libraries like Mega Parsec do that more or less by default, where they smartly figure out what the next token could have been and show you all the options. Right, right, right. <clears throat> yeah, well, continuing on, um, I think we've come across this some in our own code is, you know, the fact that, you know, monad fail and maybe don't really work well together <laughs> um to say well, the or they they do work well together maybe too well because right. fail suggests that you will get the error message and maybe says yeah i implement monad fail but i just throw that error message away right it's just like uh you know yeah it it's gives you a false sense of security for sure or like assurance i guess not security but. right yeah you feel like oh i'm doing i'm doing my part you know i'm helping us with exception reports by providing this beautiful, useful error message, but we're Maybe just throwing it away. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um, but yeah, and, and kind of a related point is the next thing he talks about with cat maybes, where um, he suggests using partition either's instead, which lets you, instead of throwing away the nothings, partition either's takes in a list of either's and gives you back a tuple where the left things are in one of them and the right things are in the other. This is a change we've actually made to a lot of the scripts that we write where initially we were using cat maybes and then either during code review or while we we're actually using the thing, we realize, wait a minute, we're just dropping these values. Like maybe that's a problem that we need to know about. So we use partition either's instead and then log them out or fail depending on what it is exactly. You mean maybe, maybe created some issues for us? <laughs> <laughs> we got to get in at least one good pun each episode. You know, I, I got to. <laughs> I mean, you know, so far the listeners haven't thrown me out yet. So that's mm -hmm. semi-positive. But yes, <laughs> maybe, maybe problematic. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I would be in favor of that. I mean, the nice thing is partition either's you know, acts the same way. And if you're in a situation where you don't really care about what the lefts say, you can just, you know, continue with the rights and move forward. You know. Yep. Yeah. Pattern match on one side of that tuple and it's exactly the same as if you called cat maybes. Oh yeah. All right. Um, so the next thing he talks about is like a design pattern and I don't mm. want to spend too much time talking about the design pattern itself. It's called the higher kinded data pattern. And it's where instead of defining a record with a bunch of concrete um, monomorphic types for the fields, you parameterize the entire record over some container type. So the example they give is some person and it has a type variable F and for each field like name, it is of type F string and age is of type F int. 
And this looks a little goofy to start, but the idea is when you're doing validation, you would have a person where F is maybe, meaning that the values are either not there yet or didn't pass validation or whatever. And then once you've validated everything, you change that F from maybe to identity. And you're saying, okay, now everything is actually there. And this is a, a powerful way. Um, I know in a previous episode, we talked about um, parse don't validate. And I, I've used validation a lot as I've been talking about this, but this is a way to uh, quote unquote parse this stuff by pushing this information to the type level and forcing yourself to prove that they're, they're all there. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, so with this, higher kind of data pattern um you know he kind of launches in with maybe all the way um and obviously in this post he's kind of saying hey be weary of maybe uh, maybe it's not the best case uh, so he starts and kind of moves towards you know i guess using either in this I, it got a little confusing there for me for a minute um but uh what do you kind of parse of the next section of, of this higher kind of data strip pattern this one gets a little tricky because with maybe, it's very easy to flip this around. So if you have a person where F is maybe, it's easy to turn that into a maybe person where F is identity because you try to get every field out of it and if it works, you're done. Um, but often what you, if you had person where F is either string, you have a choice. Do you want to stop as soon as one thing goes wrong? Or do you want to try to go as far as you can and collect as many error messages as possible and then return all of them? So the example I always think about here is if you're trying to sign up for some service and you load the form and then you just submit it and it comes back and it says, hey, first name is required. You're like, okay, cool, I'll fill out the first name. Submit the form again. Oh, last name's also required. Okay, fill that out. And then you know, do that three or four times and you get a little frustrated. Whereas if you just hit it once and it comes back and says, all of these things are required. That's the difference that I'm talking about here. Right. And he recommends a package called Barbies, which I had not heard of before, but it has a great description on hackage. It says um, types that are parametric on a functor, which is what we're talking about here, this higher kinded data pattern. Types that are parametric on a functor are like Barbies that have an outfit for each role. So maybe is an outfit, Either is an outfit, identity is an outfit. I just think that's a, a cute description of this. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the package, the Barbies package gives helpers for doing this error collection that I was just describing. Mm. Nice. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not sure I have much more to say about HKD. Was there any other stuff you wanted to know about it? Uh, no, I think that was good. I, yeah, as, as I'm reparsing through it with what you were saying, um, you know, the fact that it you know, returns this either list of field info and your example was, was great. So I really appreciate that. Yeah, happy to help. Um, and then he, uh, he goes on, the post author here goes on to talk about um, Java beans, which are, I, I wasn't aware of this as like a thing. I have worked with Java, but it's been a long time. And uh, apparently Java beans are like a class that can have an empty thing instance. Uh, yeah instance or like a default value or something like that um but i had a hard time following this section because i couldn't get these things to type check in my head with the ghc that's running in my head and then i tried with a real ghc and it wouldn't type check there either so i, I don't know what to say about this um doesn't make sense to me yeah i mean you know one one would think that you know if you have a person of you know the maybe functor, right? Functor, maybe it's functor. Okay, just want to make sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not misspeaking here, because uh, I know someone on the internet will tell me I'm wrong, and that's okay. Uh, you know, in person of identity, the you know, when you try to mix them together, that's not gonna work. I mean, and that's that whole compiler thing in your head not working. Um, <clears throat> I mean, if you wanted to, you could run maybe and have it to you know return just ten rather than identity right. ten. Um, yeah, but then the whole example would be different. Right. So a little a little more to be desired here. Maybe there's just something we're missing or misreading. Um, so, but yeah. Um, <clears throat> no, I think you know, that section was informative, but still a little confusing. So 
Um, we'll, we'll keep moving. Uh, so when we were kind of prepping for this show, uh, we talked. We, we kind of stumbled across this next section, which is the maybe first monoid, monoid fields. And <clears throat> we were also a little like, hmm, at first. And then we realized first there's just really a wrapper around maybe. Um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and, you know, then things got really interesting when we uh, made a grandpa t- toddler that happened uh, somewhere later in this example. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so like you mentioned, first is a new type wrapper around maybe, and the thing that it does for you is pick. Um, when you do like a semi-group append, that diamond operator or m append, either one, uh, it will give you the first value that is just something. So mm-hmm. if, you're, if your one on the left is a nothing, you'll get the one on the right. And if the one on the left is a just, then you'll get the one on the left, regardless of what the two values are. So it doesn't smash them together like with strings or add them together like with uh, sum or any of that stuff. And this uh, curious grandpa toddler value is where they take two people values and smoosh them together using this uh, first concept. And you can end up with some weird data where, uh, yeah, it's just like, you know, pretty much arbitrarily grabbing fields from one and the other and pushing them together. At that point, you get a grandpa, or you get a some person with a name grandpa and an aged woman. I mean, they must have yeah. started when they were real, real young. <laughs> um, and, and I'll just say for this, uh, we have done this in our code base a fair amount where we have custom data types that we have semi-group instances to combine them together. Mm-hmm. But usually we implement those instances by hand rather than leaning on these um, kind of convenience new type wrappers that the semi-group and monoid modules expose, like first and last and product and all this other stuff. Um, So this hasn't been a problem for us in practice. And uh, also we don't implement them for like our quote unquote business objects like person or whatever. Instead, it's usually for configuration or some type of aggregation that we're building up. Um, Right. So I, I do see that this is a problem, but we haven't experienced it. Right. It doesn't mean it's not out there. It's just firsthand. We're a little like, hmm, yeah, no, it doesn't seem like a problem to us, but it's because we don't yeah. use that. <clears throat> so another so, uh, big thing for, you know, that maybe has going for it is the fact that it has, you know, you know, we spoke earlier about having alternative instances and having more instances than either. Um, which allows it to be a little easier to work with because you're like, oh yeah, it's got the instance I need here. I'll just go with maybe over either rather than trying to, you know, create your own alternative instance for either. Um, yeah, if you want to either write code that is polymorphic or can use code that's polymorphic, then it turns out that you can use maybe a lot more often than you can use either. And I think that's a good segue into the next section and, and almost the last section, which is uh, we've spent this whole time trashing maybe, but when is a good time to use maybe? Hmm. Oh, good old maybe. Right. And, you know, we kind of touched on it in the beginning, right? Um, you know, and the author here says he follows a, you know, an old design principle called P- Postel's Law, um, where, you know, lenient input, strict output, um, right? You know, things that can be put input to the system can be more flexible than what is returned from the system. Right. Um, so... In this particular case, that means like I, using either for your input would be more strict because you would be requiring people to give you this error information. But mm-hmm. with a maybe, you're just saying, I need to know whether it's there or not. I don't need to know why it wasn't there. So that's a little more lenient. Right. So go maybe. Woo. <laughs> In this section. <laughs> I, I do think it's funny that he explicitly mentions uh, data.map.lookup as somewhere that's probably fine to use maybe, because for me, that's one place where I want either. And when I talk about in our code base where we decorate maybe values with error information, it's often on this where we're doing three or four lookups in a row and we wanna know which one failed. And it's really convenient to say, oh, I couldn't find this key rather than just getting back nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe that's a uh, future enhancement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where we'll have yeah we'll, we'll we end up doing a lot of note lookup using that helper function we talked about <laughs> yeah. i mean at this point we should just probably you know pull an instance of lookup into our prelude that does yeah, that it has that on there yeah probably 
could make life a little easier, but you know, note look up wasn't the worst thing in the world either. But <clears throat> well, awesome. Yeah, I think that was uh, you know some good cases for using maybe, and you know, overall, maybe either is the way to go. But you know, maybe has its place. That's why yeah. it's in the ecosystem. Yeah, this is a compelling argument to me, and I've I've found I haven't you know crystallized this opinion myself or. or thought too much about it before, but reading through this post, I was like, yeah, you know, most of the time I would prefer something that dealt with either or something isomorphic to either mm -hmm. rather than maybe so that when something goes wrong, I'll know why. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> to kind of recap, um, the author's causes, um, for thinking, you know, for saying the, it's overused, uh, you know, he says, you know, using maybe is simpler than either, um, you know, coding with maybe is terser um which is a fun word terser <laughs> <laughs> um you know maybe it is more expressive really having more instances available to it um and then you know the sophisticated abstractions can can obscure the common sense but um <clears throat> you know use maybe it's gonna make it do what you want <laughs> um, you know it can make it do what you want but you may also be missing information and losing out on things right. you expect to be there yeah, I think this ties into the previous one where since maybe has more instances, you can use it with more abstractions and mm -hmm. it, it will probably all type check, but you may end up with something that's very confusing either to use or to debug. Precisely. Well, awesome, Taylor. Well, thanks for being on the show with me today. And thank you listeners for tuning in. Um, ha Taylor, where can they find us? <laughs> well, uh, they could probably just Google for Haskell Weekly. That might be the easiest way. But mm, if you want to go cool. straight to the source, our website is haskellweekly.news. We're on Twitter. Our handle is Haskell Weekly. We're on Reddit, same handle. We're on GitHub, same handle. And uh, if you want to suggest something to us, you could send an email to info at haskellweekly.news. Mm, they can't find us on MySpace? We we had to take down our MySpace page. It's just, mm. yeah. It's okay. That's okay, though, because the Haskell Weekly Podcast is brought to you by IT Pro TV, the e-learning platform for IT professionals and also our employer. Um, and we thank them for letting us do such an incredible show. Uh, <clears throat> they are also very generous because they would love to offer all of our listeners a 30% discount code to, for the lifetime of the subscription by using Haskell Weekly 30 at checkout. And that will get you 30% off the lifetime of that subscription. So it's a hot deal. Go check it, it out. Yeah. And I think that'll do it for us this week. See you next week. Peace.